Hi, I'm Peter J. Ray. Welcome to Adventures in History. Today's topic is Zachary Taylor, Part 1. Zachary Taylor was the 12th President of the United States. He was elected in 1848, served from March of 1849 until July of 1850, only a year and four months. So he, he, he died in office, did not uh, finish his term. He was the first president elected without any political experience. He'd never been elected to a, a, uh, any, uh, any off, governmental office before. Some call it, described him as short and plump. Actually, he had a large head and a large torso, but his, uh, and, and very strong physically, but his legs were short, and so that gave, they were, he's kind of out of proportion. He was a physically strong fellow. Taylor was an Episcopalian Christian. He was the seventh of eight uh, U.S. presidents born in Virginia, although only the first year of his life was spent there. He, he grew up in Kentucky and then as an adult made his home in Louisiana and lived all over the United States during his military service. He was known for wearing a battered straw hat. His nickname was Old Rough and Ready. Old rough because he was he wore lousy clothes and he would rough it with the guys in in uh, during military during war and battles he would uh, live the uh, live the life that the that the common soldiers were living even though he was a general and ready because he was a one when, when the time came for battles in war he was ready to fight he's a very brave man and kept cool uh, during battles very, very effective commanding general during battles in war. He was known for his sloppy dress, which increased with his rank. Yeah, he, Zachary Taylor was not a fashionable man. He, he did not really care about appearance and clothing. So he, he, what, what was important to him was comfort, comfortable, comfortable clothing, practical clothing. And, uh, and as his rank went up, he, he didn't wear, he didn't dress well. And uh, kind of like similar to Thomas Jefferson, who also didn't really care about fashion. It was said that during the Mexican War, that General Taylor, Zach Taylor, wore old farm clothes commanding the American army in the north. And they also said he treated bullets as trifles. A very brave man. During battles, he was, he was brave. He kept his, kept his cool and, uh, and really was helpful when, when there's a tendency to panic and when a lot of the guys are panicking because of fear. He supported the Hungarian Revolution, independence for Hungary against Austria, and he also supported statehood for New Mexico and Utah and religious freedom for the Mormons. Uh, as an adult, he owned 200 slaves on his property in Louisiana. Now, written on the inside cover of the, of the Zachary Taylor biography by John S.D. Eisenhower, these words, quote, The rough-hewn general who rose to the nation's highest office and whose presidency witnessed the first political skirmishes that would lead to the Civil War. Zachary Taylor was a soldier's soldier, a man who lived up to his nickname, Old Rough and Ready. Having risen through the ranks of the U.S. Army, he achieved his greatest success in the Mexican War, propelling him to the nation's highest office in the election of 1848. He was the first man to have been elected without having held a lower political office. John S.D. Eisenhower, son of another soldier president, that would be Dwight Eisenhower, shows how Taylor rose to the presidency, where he confronted the most contentious political issue of his age, slavery. The political storm reached a crescendo in 1849 when California, newly populated after the gold rush, applied for statehood with an anti-slavery constitution an event that upset the delicate balance of slave and free states and, bo and pushed both sides to the brink. As the acrimonious debate intensified, T Taylor stood his ground in favor of California's admission, despite being a slaveholder himself. In July of 1850, however, he unexpectedly took ill, and within a week he was dead. His truncated pre presidency had exposed the fateful rift that would soon tear the country apart. Zachary Taylor was born on November 24, 1784, in Orange County, Virginia, the youngest of nine children, and in, in, in near, actually near Montpellier, the, the famous home of James Madison, the, uh, the uh, fourth U.S. president. He was uh, cousins with James Madison and Robert E. Lee. 
Uh, when he was uh, only a baby, one year old, the family moved to an area near Louisville, Kentucky. Uh, his father had a thousand acres there, which he received as a bonus for his service in the Revolutionary War. His, fa- his father fought in the American Revolution and received this land as, as a reward. Uh, his name, his father's name was Colonel Richard Taylor. Now, there were no schools in Kentucky at that time, so Zach Taylor had tutors growing up, and he grew up in Kentucky. And Kentucky at the time was uh, having plenty of Indian warfare, so Zach Taylor grew up in the midst of Indian warfare, and that sure affected him. Uh, by the time 1808, he was 23 years old, and uh, he joined the military, and that became his career, more, much more than anything else. The vast majority of his life was the next 40 years until he became president. He spent a little bit of time farming, but for 40 years he was served in the U.S. Army, rising from a lieutenant to major general. He fought American Indians, ongoing Indian wars. He was c- commanded frontier posts and uh, became famous serving in the Mexican War. He got his commission as first lieutenant through the influence of his cousin, James Madison, who was Secretary of State at the time. Taylor had developed a strong nationalist spirit, very much pro-union, probably largely due to all the traveling he did all over the country. In 1809, he recruited 80 men for a regiment and traveled to New Orleans, uh, New Orleans, Louisiana. In June of 1809, he was the commander of Fort Pickering near Memphis, Tennessee. His older brother had been killed by Indians there the year before. 1810, uh, Zach Taylor got married. He got he had a very good marriage. His wife's uh, name was Margaret Smith. They called her Peggy, and there is no uh, there was no painting of her, no photography then, no paintings, no image exists of her. His wife uh, Peggy has smoked a corn cob pipe like Rachel Jackson. Thinking they had a very good marriage, although they weren't together a lot because he was off and all over the place in the military. They had six children, Zach and Peggy Taylor. Uh, so their son, Richard, was a lieutenant general in the Confederate Army in the Civil War. And then they had five daughters as well. Four of their, four of their children lived to maturity. Two died at a young age. Taylor's brother, Joseph, was also a general in the Confederate Army. When Taylor ran for, ran for president in 1848, his wife, uh, Margaret, or Peggy, did not approve. She did not. Uh, she did not. Was not a social person, and when, as first lady, she really didn't serve. She spent her time knitting in her room upstairs and entertaining uh, fa- uh, friends and relatives. By 1811, Zachary Taylor was commander of Fort Knox, Kentucky. Uh, Fort Knox near near Vincennes in well Fort Knox near Vincennes, Indiana. He was a recruiter at. Uh, in, in Louisville, Kentucky, recruiting men. In April, his daughter, Anne, was born. 1812 was the beginning of the War of 1812 against Great Britain and the British Indian allies, and Taylor became a public figure. He became famous specifically for his defense of Fort Harrison, Indiana, which was attacked by the Shawn- by, uh, by American Indians led by the Shawnee chief Tecumseh, who was, faint, was the great, great American Indian trying to uh, or, uh, organize American Indians to stop American expansion. In this uh, battle, the Indians set fire to the blockhouse, and there was the danger that the whole fort would catch fire. Benson Lossing, historian, wrote, quote, Nothing saved the fort but the presence of mind, courage, prudence, and energy of the commander. The fire was about to communicate to the barracks when he shouted, Pull off the roofs nearest the blockhouse. Pour on water and all will be well. His voice gave courage to his troops. Water was brought in 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 buckets and several of the men, led by Dr. Clark, climbed to the roof, cut off the boards, and by great exertions, in the face of bows and arrows, they subdued the flames and saved the menaced buildings. So Fort Harrison was saved. Uh, Zach Taylor's uh, and his... uh, and the guys there, the defense of Fort Harrison brought Indian aggression in the Indiana Territory to a halt. And Tecumseh and his Indian forces withdrew to the north to uh, operate and cooperate with British military forces. 
In that uh, attack, September of 1812, when the Indians attacked Fort Harrison, they had 450 Indian braves. And uh, t- regarding the fire which had been set, Taylor said, quote, Most of the men immediately gave themselves up for lost, and I had the greatest difficulty in getting my orders executed. From the raging of the fire, the yelling and howling of several hundred Indians, and cries of nine women and children. 1812, uh, one of the American objectives was to consolidate the frontier of the Wabash. American General Sam Hopkins, and, and with the assistance of Zach Taylor, led a force of 2,000 militia to destroy the Kickapoo Indian village on the Illinois River. That failed and they retreated to Vincennes, Indiana. By 1814, uh, Taylor was in St. Louis and was sent on a mission north on the Mississippi River to burn Indian villages in the ongoing fighting against American Indians. Indians were elusive. It's hard to fight because there was lots of, lots of land, and they would disappear. In August, of, in August there were 400, he was with 430 militia at the Rock River, and they were fighting Indians there. And they built Fort Johnson, where the Des Moines River meets the Mississippi River. Historian and biographer K. Jack Bauer wrote, quote, Zachary Taylor was slow to anger and to find fault, but once he concluded that an individual had treated him unfairly, he would respond viciously. 1815, Taylor resigned from the Army, tired of Army life. He returned to Louisville, Kentucky, to pursue farming. He had a farm there. He was growing corn and tobacco. However, he got bored, and he said, quote, My life affords me nothing sufficiently interest, interesting to trouble my friends by communicating with them on the subject. So by the following year, 1816, he reenlisted in the Army, was sent, was sent to Det- and he was in Detroit, Michigan, and given command of Fort Howard at Green Bay, Wisconsin, on the frontier. At that time, Green Bay, the people there were French citizens with Indian wives. And he was there for two years. By 1818, he was on furlough to Louisville, Kentucky, and then he had to, for, for a year. By 1819, he was promoted to lieutenant colonel. During that time, he met President James Monroe and Andrew Jackson, who visited Louisville, Kentucky. In 1820, uh, Madison was in Louisiana, uh, or in Madison, I'm sorry, Taylor was in Madison, Louisiana, building the Jackson Road. That was part of the, part of military service was was in building roads. That same year, 1820, his daughter Octavia was age three and died of malaria. And uh, also his daughter, uh, baby daughter, Margaret, also died. So they lost these two young daughters. His wife, Margaret, or Peggy, survived. she got malaria but survived, but was a semi-invalid for the rest of her life. From 1820 to 1830, uh, Taylor was, had uh, frontier duty on the American frontier. Actually, Taylor uh, was somewhat of an intellectual as well. He read and enjoyed discussing Hume's History of England, so he enjoyed history. By 1830, Harrison was in uh, Fort Crawford, Wisconsin, and there was an incident where he was mustered a garrison for a dress parade, and there was a large German uh, soldier who was out of line, who, who spoke very little English, and Taylor, General Taylor gave the order to dress the line, which means they should line up properly, and the German didn't respond. Uh, Taylor believed this was willful disobedience, so he decided to punish this fellow right there with, the, with what they called wooling, which means he would grab the man's ears and, and shook him. Now, the guy didn't like it. The German punched uh, Taylor and knocked him down. So this was considered uh, you know, a, a crime. But Taylor said, quote, Let that man alone. He will make a good soldier. And he did. So that was, that was good. He, maybe he realized he was wrong in that situation. 1832 was the Black, the Black Hawk War took place, and Taylor was involved in that. That was, that was a victory for the United States against American Indians. And uh, General Taylor accepted, personally accepted the surrender of Black Hawk. Abraham Lincoln, Jefferson Davis, and Winfield Scott all, all were involved in that war. Near the early 1830s, the Sauk Indians in northern Illinois, uh, the northwest, uh, in the northwest on Rock Island, became rebellious. 
And their leader was a 65-year-old Sauk chief named Black Hawk, who had an intense hatred for the white man. The Black Hawk War lasted for three months, from May to July of 1832. Black Hawk was wanted to recover Indian land. They were in the process, all the Indians, of losing their lands, and he wanted to recover Indian land, so he started this war. That year, uh, Taylor and he was with the U.S. military at Fort Armstrong in Rock Island, Mississippi, and then in, in, in Illinois in April. Black Hawk had 1,500 Sauk Indians, including 500 Braves, who crossed the Mississippi, moved up the Rock River, and uh, they, they, killed 200, they killed 200 American settlers. And so this, this set off a panic among Americans. Uh, Black Hawk retreated on the Mississippi, and uh, there was also an Indian fighting. The, the Sauk were fighting the Sioux Indians in Wisconsin, so yeah, they, they, they weren't united, and Black Hawk surrendered on August 27th. Most of the fighting in this war was done by the militia. Now, this year, uh, Jefferson Davis, who became the president of the Confederacy during the Civil War, he was courting Zachary Taylor's daughter, Sarah. And Taylor was against this. Uh, he didn't want his daughter marrying a guy in the army because he knew he believed it wasn't a, 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 a good life for, for women because the men were off and were away so much. From their, from their families. He didn't want his daughter to marry uh, and mili- have a military husband. By 1835, his daughter Sarah did marry Jefferson Davis, future president of the Confederacy, but she died three months later. She got sick and died of malaria, so she was not the first lady of the Confederacy. This was the great tragedy in Zachary Taylor's life, uh, the, the death of his daughter, who was, he was in her 20s. She was... Uh, and again, he had been against uh, her marrying Jeff- Jefferson Davis, and he said, quote, I know enough of the family life of officers. I scarcely know my children or they me. So this was very tragic. So he heard his daughter Sarah died in September of 1835 at a young, at a young age. 1837, Zachary Taylor was uh, fighting Seminole Indians in Florida, he achieved a Christmas Day victory, which led to a promotion. He was given, given command of all troops in Florida. Fighting the Seminoles was tough. Yeah, they would move around a lot. In 1836, Francis Dade, for whom Dade County is known, uh, was uh, leading American forces when was defeated by the Seminoles. Hard to find them. Now, this battle was in December, uh, Christmas Day. The Seminoles were divided into three independent groups. Plenty of swamp fighting, which, you know, that made it very tough. And uh, these victories were, were limited. The Seminoles would, would disappear. In the victory, there were 26 Americans killed, 126 wounded. The Seminoles had 11 killed and 14 wounded. January 30th of 1838, Osceola, the great Seminole Indian leader, died in a prison in Charleston, South Carolina. Like Tecumseh, he's admired today as a great American Indian. There are 20 towns, two lakes, two and two mountains, and, and there's a state park, National Forest, all named after Osceola, a great American Indian hero. During the, his fighting, during General T- Zack Taylor's fighting of the Seminole Indians in Florida, he got the nickname Old Rough and Ready from his troops in recognition of his willingness to share their privations in the field. 1840, May 5th, uh, Taylor, uh, by that time, Taylor had served longer than any other commander in the Seminole War and was granted a permission to transfer. He was tired of fighting Seminole Indians in Florida. That same month, in May of 1840, the Kawachi Seminoles attacked a touring William Shakespeare company near St. Augustine, Florida, where my mother actually taught school from the 1940s. They, they uh, killed three actors and got a huge uh, amount of uh, wardrobe costumes as their prize. Again, 1840, uh, Taylor was tired and pessimistic regarding the possibility of defeating the Seminoles. So he was given the command of Fort Gibson in Oklahoma, the last stop on the Trail of Tears when they moved American Indians west to, uh, from, from the southeast. And he, spent, uh, he, spent four, he was in Fort Smith, Arkansas for three years on the front, Indian frontier, and that was, those were, that was quiet. By 1841, Taylor was given command of the Southern Division of the U.S. Army, 
and by this time he made his home in Baton Rouge, Louisiana. He had a plantation with the 200 slaves. August of 1842 was the end of the Seminole War. It was the longest, most expensive, and deadliest war fought against American Indians, lasting seven years. The U.S. spent $30 million. There were uh, 1,400 uh, U.S. Army deaths, and 300 Seminole Indians never surrendered, surrendered including Chief Alligator. So they, what the U.S. was trying to get them to, the Seminoles to all surrender and then be moved west to uh, the Indian Territory, now Oklahoma. But they finally gave up. The U.S. gave up and said, all right, you guys can stay these last 300 Seminoles. So there are Seminole Indians today in Florida uh, who, and who are descendants of, of the Seminoles who, who, who never left. And my father was in Florida back in the 1930s as a boy. And he, he talked about the Seminole Indians there. 1845, the United States annexed Texas, and uh, which... Um, Texas had become independent of Mexico, and uh, the U.S. annexing it or accepting it into the Union uh, meant uh, possible war with Mexico, because the Mexicans said, hey, if you take Texas, we're going to war. And so Zach Taylor was uh, uh, sent to uh, lead the American military against a, a possible attack by Mexico against Texas. And he was sent to the Rio Grande. And then, of course, uh, this was the beginning of the Mexican War in which he served in in fighting in the northeastern part of Mexico. June of 1845, he was ordered to to go to Fort Jessup, Louisiana, from Fort Jessup to the Sabine River in Texas to protect Texans, uh, Texas from a Mexican attack. Texas president was Sam Houston. In July, uh, Taylor moved to Corpus Christi, Texas, with the 3rd and 44th Infantry Regiments. Now, there was the dispute about the Texas-Mexico border. Texas had been independent, but the question, what was the border? Either the Nueces River or the Rio Grande. So it was 150 miles of disputed territory. This was in July, but there were, he had 3,500 American troops under his command. George Meade said this about Zachary Taylor, quote, He is a plain, sensible old gentleman who laughs very much at the excitement in the northern states on account of his position and thinks there is not the remotest possibility of there being any war. And a lot of stories about Zachary Taylor. One of them, a young lieutenant, came to, quote, see the general. And he saw, this, he saw an old man cleaning a saber, and he offered him a dollar to clean his saber. And this old fellow uh, said, okay. And uh, he, he returned the next day and learned that the old man was Zachary Taylor. And Taylor's response was, I'll take that, I'll take that dollar. So Taylor, he had cleaned, he, had, he hadn't identified himself and said, okay. And he'd accepted the saber, and he cleaned it, and he expected to be paid. So he was very informal. He was not a pretentious man. Now, during this time, early stages of the war, uh, President James K. Polk was negotiating with Mexico to avoid the war, but they were, he was unable to succeed in that endeavor. 1846, January, President Polk ordered Zach Taylor and the Army to go to the Rio Grande River. And in March, uh, the Army did that. They marched to the Rio Grande. Taylor was 61 years old. Now, in Matamoros was the Mexican town on the opposite side of the Rio Grande. The Mexican general was Francisco Mejia, and there was a standoff at the Rio Grande between the American armies on, on the east and the Mexican armies on the west. There were many German and, and Irish immigrants in the U.S. Army fighting in Mexico. The Mexican general Mejia, Mejia was replaced by General Mariano Arista, and 3,000 more Mexican troops arrived. Arista crossed the Rio Grande with 1,600 men and killed 16 Americans, uh, American troops. Uh, Zach Taylor sent a message to Washington, quote, Hostilities may now be considered as commenced. February of 1846, Zachary Taylor gave an order to his troops, quote, He strictly enjoins all under his command to observe with the most scrupulous regard for the rights of all persons who may be found in the peaceful pursuit of the the respective avocations, residing on both banks of the Rio Grande, 
no person under any pretense whatsoever will interfere in any manner with the civil rights or religious privileges of the people, but will pay the utmost respect to both. Yeah, actually, uh, Taylor gave orders when uh, there were um, uh, wounded Mexicans uh, who came under the uh, care of the U.S. that they would get the same care, same medical care as American troops. And that the Mexican people, they would be respected. There would be no looting, no, 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 no mistreatment of the Mexicans. So he, he realized, you know, that you have to win people over. And he was, he was a good man. And, and, you know, the Mexicans had been taught, like, wow, well, if the Americans come, you know, they'll uh, outlaw Catholicism. And they were, a, Mexicans were a majority Catholic people. And Americans were majority Protestant. But he said, no, we will respect these people. We're at war but we will respect the people. We're fighting the war. So that was a very good thing, very good attitude that he had. May of 1846, uh, James Buchanan, was U.S. Secretary of State, was negotiating with the Great Britain uh, regarding the Oregon Territory, and they resolved this, uh, finally divided the territory at the 49th parallel. So it had been under joint occupation. So the Oregon Territorial Dispute was resolved which meant uh, President Polk was ready for war with, uh, with, uh, te- with Mexico. And after the fighting started, Congress uh, declared war on Mexico and voted to increase the American army by 50,000 men. May 8th, there was fighting at the Battle of Palo, Palo Alto, and, uh, and a big advantage the American army had was their artillery was better. This was a victory, and the Mexicans retreated. However, there were, tw- there were 1,200 Mexicans killed in, that, in the Battle of Palo Alto, and 1,000 Mexicans deserted. On the American side, Jacob Brown was killed, and Brownsville, Texas, is named after him. Another battle was Resca de la Palma, second victory of the U.S. against the uh, Mexicans. Uh, Henry Clay Jr. was killed in the Mexican War. Very tragic for his father, Henry Clay, the famous uh, politician. Now, there were a lot of famous uh, Civil War generals who fought in the Mexican War, including Ulysses S. Grant, William Tecumseh Sherman. You see the respect for Tecumseh in the middle name of William Tecumseh Sherman. George McClellan, who was at one time, the early part of the Civil War, the top general. Robert E. Lee, who became the top general for the Confederacy. Stonewall Jackson, as well as Jefferson Davis, who was the... uh, president of the confederacy well that concludes today's presentation we'll continue next time with part two the mexican war and the continuation of the life of zachary taylor the 12th u.s president uh you might you might consider checking out our website adventures in history with peter j ray at peterjray.com so far we've made 598 history videos in seven areas world history american history book reviews, poetic tours, Cleveland baseball, family history, and autobiography. You you also might consider checking out our podcast, Adventures in History. Thanks so much for watching. I really appreciate it. God bless you. Take care, and I'll see you next time.